In this video, I'm gonna take this piece of galena and try to turn it into pure silver. Now, do I know how to do this? No, but I found this book published in 1886 that goes through every step of the process. And this is gonna be my guide as I try to create my first batch of silver here the way they did 150 years ago. So right now I'm staying in the assay office at Cerro Gordo. And back in the 1800s, something like $500 million worth of minerals were pulled from these mountains all around me. And the quality of those minerals would have been determined in an office much like this. Here, an assayer would have taken the ore samples from these different claims or mines, reduced them down, and tried to determine how much silver could have been in a ton of the minerals in that deposit. And the primary mineral that they were mining at Cerro Gordo was Galena. And Galena contains a lot of lead and a very little bit of silver. And over the past three years owning Cerro Gordo, I found deposits of Galena left in the, you know, 30 miles of mines underneath the town. And I always wondered, what does it take to go from this down to a pure silver? Because that process, you know, this pursuit of silver is the reason I'm here. You know, it's the reason that this patch of earth has the history that it does. You know, the pursuit of silver brought thousands of men and women to come up and live here. You know, it required hundreds of buildings to be built and it developed that history that I've dedicated my life to try to understand and to teach to people that come up and on this channel. So it would seem that a big part of understanding the history of Cerro Gordo is understanding how they mine the minerals and how they refine them here at Cerro Gordo. So this week, after three years, I'm gonna take this book from 1886 that I found here in the assay office called Notes on Assaying and try to create silver for myself. You know, I'm sure there's much more sophisticated ways these days to go about this process, but I'm really interested in you know, what that process took in Cerro Gordo's heyday. And this was 1886, that was kind of the peak of Cerro Gordo's activity. And so in this video, I'm gonna go through how they assayed minerals back in the 1800s, some of the history of the refining here at Cerro Gordo, and hopefully in the end, create the very first batch of Cerro Gordo silver in a very, very long time. All right, to understand the refining process game here at Cerro Gordo, we first have to come to these. This is a very early furnace put up by some of the Mexican prospectors that came up to Cerro Gordo before it was even established as a main town. You know, 1860s, these were what they would use to refine the silver. These are called vasos. And these vasos, before the town was a major production, is how they would refine and reduce the minerals into the lead and silver. Not only were these big in the early days of Cerro Gordo, these played a crucial role in making Cerro Gordo into what it became because, as the story goes, around 1868, Mortimer Belshaw and his future business partner, Victor Beaudry, walked these hills and they would come across old vassals like this, these crude furnace operations. And they realized that if these types of operations could create the quality and quantity of ore that they were seeing back in San Francisco in these major towns, that there was surely untapped amounts of silver and lead in these mountains just waiting, you know, to be refined. And so after seeing stuff like this, Belshaw decided to invest in what would become the Union Mine that is just up the hill a little bit. And his investment wasn't just money. He invested a promise to create a better furnace to be able to refine more ore. And that was his contribution to get his start here into Cerro Gordo. So Belshaw and Beaudry had all sorts of ways of seizing control of this mountain. You know, what Beaudry would do is he had the general store. And if you couldn't pay your bill, he would take your mining claim in exchange, you know, on credit. And then when you didn't pay him, he would take over your claim. And similarly, when Belshaw and Beaudry had their furnaces going, they would charge $50 a ton to refine anybody else's ore in the area. And you generally have another option. You know, if you were mining a different claim at Cerro Gordo or in the surrounding area, you have to use their furnaces. But the thing is, a lot of times this ore wouldn't even assay for that amount. So at the end, you would be able to pay your bills, leaving Belshaw and Beaudry to take over your mine. So no matter which way you're coming, these two guys just 
seized control of the entire mountain one way or the other. So this is it. This would have been the site of Belshaw's furnace they built in 1868. And just up there is the Union Mine, but down here where you can start seeing all the red rock, this is where his furnace was, and this is where he created the water jacket, which was a revolution in the day. You know, not only was Belshaw smart enough to do everything else he did at the town, but he actually invented a new type of furnace that was able to increase output tremendously that not only got used here, but it got used at all of the other mines. And Belshaw chose this location because it was by the Union Mine, but also there's this cliff where he could throw off all the extra slag. This is slag, so this would have been the waste rock that they used during the refining process of the silver and the lead. So this would have been left over. And in the early days, there would almost be 40% of the silver and lead left in this because they weren't able to refine it properly at the time. The chemistry wasn't there. But then in the early 1900s, they actually came back through here and re-refined this. Because if you could get, you know, 40% more out of this slag, then you're doing pretty good, you know? You can see some of the old cribbing and even some more of the slag up there and the red rock that was used to make the chimney for these furnaces. And at its peak, this furnace that used to sit here, there used to be this massive building. And you can see this photo of the building with tons of cords of wood on the hill and tons of bars waiting for shipment. But at its peak, this furnace could refine 24 tons of ore per day. And they needed 350 bushels of charcoal and up to 30,000 gallons of water to run this thing back in the day. Which is crazy, you know, because Belshaw just insisted that the furnace be run 24 hours a day, you know, so there's always these smoke clouds in the skies. By 1876, Belshaw was getting 60 tons of ore per day from the Union Mine. And so what he would do is he would bring it to the surface over there, wagons would take it the 150 yards over here where it would start to be refined. And to support the Belshaw furnace, which was humming, you know, it was rocking and rolling 24 hours a day, his partner, Victor Beaudry, in 1870, created an additional furnace down closer to town, which is where we are going to go next. Beaudry was the business partner of Mr. Mortimer Belshaw, and this was a construction in 1870. As you can see, it's right close into the middle of town here. And back in the day, there used to be a massive wooden building around this. That's gone, but a lot of the traces of how active this area used to be are still here. And this furnace at its peak employed 25 different guys, which is hard to believe that 25 people were working here full time. And the payroll back then was $3,000 a month, which is about, oh, $60,000 in today's money. So this was a serious operation that was also going 24 hours a day. At its peak, it, they were using about eight tons of charcoal to refine 25 tons of galena. So the amount of wood and water that these two furnaces, Belshaw's, which is way up there by the Union, and Beaudry's, which is here, was just crazy. This furnace and that furnace were creating 400 bars per day for Cerro Gordo. There were so many bars that when they used to ship them down to the lake there, there was a backlog of 30,000 bars waiting to be shipped down there. And there were so many that the miners used to just build houses out of them. Literally used to stack them like you would stack rocks right here, put a canvas tarp over them, and then use them as housing. See these bars that Belshaw and Beaudry were making? Something like this, oh, very heavy were what they called base bullion. And base bullion was still basically lead and silver, just with the other impurities removed. That means that you had to have a certain level of expertise to refine these bars. So they were less likely targets for bandits, you know, people that would rob the stagecoaches. If they knew that they would have to then take it and find somewhere to separate the lead from the silver, that place is gonna probably ask, hey, how do you have all these bars stamped Cerro Gordo on them, and that's gonna cause a lot of concern. And so what they did is these bars ugh, were shipped to San Francisco, where they were further refined into lead, and the silver was sent off to the US Mint. Remember back in that day, lead was at least relatively more valuable than it is today. It was used for a lot more things. So even the cost of lead for Belshaw and Beaudry would cover their shipping cost and the refining cost, and the silver would almost be pure profit.
Now, I've wanted to make silver up at Cerro Gordo for as long as I've had Cerro Gordo. And so the first step in all of this is I had to collect Galena. Today, the mission is to find some Galena to then refine. I always thought it'd be cool to take, you know, the raw silver lead ore here and make it down into pure silver, maybe make it into some jewelry. So the quest for the next few days is just to collect all the Galena I can find around the property. This is the stope and hopefully that is the Galena. That's Galena. See the sparkle? That's Galena. Oh, I got a big boy piece. Yeah. There's a bunch up here. Is this something? No. Blends in so well though. See the shiny metallic? See how shiny that is? Glitter City. All right, that's going in the backpack. This little pocket seems to have a lot. See, there's another. See that? It's another five, 10 pound piece. Getting a good amount. This pocket, oh, there's another piece. I think we only need like 20 pounds to get the amount that I want to make. How do you think that is? I want to see what it looks like. We'll feel how heavy it is first. See if we're... That's good. That's um, definitely 30 pounds at least. That's what I figure. Let's see. see a tiny little bit up there. See how heavy that shit is? Yeah. Where are you finding this shit? Where are you finding the damn thing? <laughs> well, that was relatively quick, you know? Came, wanted 20 pounds of Galena. Probably got at least that. I'm gonna get out of here because this is overstoped and all these big boulders have fallen down over time. So no reason to spend more time in here than we need to. So I'm gonna get out of here, go back home, weigh this glean that we got, see how many pounds it is. Try to make this into some silver. Twenty-five pounds. That'll do. Sweet. So, step one, collective Galena. Step two, came back here, had all the chemicals arrive in the mail that I needed. And from there, I was just exploring. So, notes on assaying. So somebody had this and was learning in 1901. And I think that I'm here sitting, trying to learn the same thing 120 years ago from the same book. Is a super cool way to start this. All right, so if we dive into this book, there are five Simple steps in making this Galena down into silver. Simple obviously is not true. So step number one, sampling and pulverizing. All right, we're here in the assay office. Pulverize using the grinding plate and rubber, which we have down here. All right, we're gonna pulverize. It's very shiny as you can see, very excited. I think we're gonna knock it out first try. Step one, we're gonna nail this, have perfect silver. Doing it the old school way of doing it, kind of like they used to. The really exciting thing for me about going through this process is just having a deeper understanding into the assay process and just the life of an assayer. The job of the assayer was trying to determine how much the value of the mineral content in a certain claim. And he would do the math. He would say, hey, I put in 30 grams of ore, I got out one gram of silver. I can extrapolate that to tell you that the value of the tonnage of your claim is X. And so really like miners dreams came into an office like this to either be made or be crushed. And the majority of the time an assayer's job was crushing miners dreams. But because of that excitement, you have to imagine the assayer back in the mining towns knew more about that hill than anybody else, even more than the big owners, you know? There are stories where investors, engineers, everybody used to huddle around asset offices like this, just weighing the news of the next big strike, you know? So there's always potential excitements inside of walls like these, you know, guys just coming here and knowing that maybe that was gonna be the day where they finally struck it rich or that was the day where they were gonna have to go out, find another claim, and do it all over again. As you can see, it's getting much, it's kinda of like powder. So I'm putting it through here. That 
is what we're looking for. Nice fine grade Galena, yum. Throw a tablespoon of that a day. Well, you'd probably die, but you know, we're not gonna die. We're now gonna try to make it about 30 grams. And this is the counterweight is about 27. Now we need to weigh out all of the charges. So the things we're gonna put in. Then you get into the roasting. So you wanna roast the ore. So day one, I decided to go the most tried and true way that the book outlined. And that was fire assaying with the step of having to roast the galena. I went up to the hoist. There, we have a kiln from an unknown date, probably 80s or 90s if I had to guess. That is not the most efficient kiln. So there's a lot of standing around. The roasting is going to remove the sulfur. And so it's a pretty specific process. You know, it's not one that they get into too close of detail here. You know, things that you might think that they would include like, oh, you know, temperature at which to roast the ore. They, they conveniently left out. All right, now this stuff, let's make sure I glean in sand. It's going in here. All right, so we're almost at 15 hundo. And if you see, we're getting the fumes that we want, the white fumes. It's getting a little clumpy. Woo! Not smell good. You do not want, at this point, fusion. You do not want the galena turning into like a solid. You want to keep it in the granular form, but just roast off all the sulfur, which is easier said than done. I had numerous cases where I burnt it or I melted it. I had to discard it and start over. No more real fumes coming off. So we're gonna let it cool down. And then from there, we're gonna add all the charges. You've pulverized and weighed. Now you've roasted. Number three comes when you add in all these additives and you are looking for fusion. Over the course of days, I changed the formula of additives, borax, lead oxide and stuff a lot as I would experiment. Because if you're looking through this book, you can see there's ranges for everything. You know, every formula that they give you in here is ranges. And so it takes a little bit of experimentation. Yes, it's a science, but it's also a bit of an art. And obviously I'm not gonna master an art over the course of a few days. So first, I'm gonna put in the toasted galena. Borax. Now I'm gonna add in the litharge or uh, lead oxide. Finally, baking soda. It's crazy to think about back in the day how they figured this out. You know, how did they figure it out to put this, this, this? How do they get all of these chemicals? to fill this much crucible. And at the end of this, you have to imagine, we're doing all of this, and in the end, we hope to have a tiny little button of silver that's barely gonna fill the bottom of this thing. Step three, you got your stuff in the crucible, you throw it in, and with that, we will see you when you're closer to being silver. So to lead up to this thing that we're gonna do later in the video, I'm gonna need a lot of Galena crunched up. That's gonna happen over here. And as a little teaser of what I'm trying to do. Yep. This process has been taking a while. As you can see, we're running up against the sunset now. But look at that, dang! This took legitimately all day and into the night. You know, I remember being up there just twiddling my thumbs for hours and hours and hours waiting for this kiln to get to speed. All right, as you may be able to see, it is properly dark out. This kiln was not getting there. It needed to be wrapped with some tin foil, but now we are officially at 1750 Fahrenheit. So the timer is set. This needs to sit for another 45 minutes. It's like the opposite of an easy bake oven. That is how hot it is. I'm gonna wait there for this to cool down a little bit, for that slag to form on top. So you pull out your slag, you break it, and at the bottom, you get the next step, which is the lead button. All right, this is the moment of truth. Now, if everything went right, you're left with lead and silver. And so after that, you come to the second to last step in this process, cupellation. And cupellation is where you take a cupel. What you're gonna do is you're gonna put the silver and lead in here, this lead button, heat this thing up. This thing is made out of animal bones. And so what's gonna allow the lead to do is to oxidize when the silver won't oxidize. And the lead will get absorbed into this bone ash 
and you'll be left with a tiny little bead of silver. And in the end, you get that. The tiniest bead of silver from that amount of Galena. So that night I went back, slept on it, thought, you know what, I'm not really satisfied with that result. I don't think that was as good as it could be. So I decided to go back up to the hoist and try method number two under fire assaying, where you add additives in and that way you don't have to roast the Galena. All right, back on another stormy day. All right, with the new day, there's gonna be a little bit different formula, a little bit different additives. KNO3 nitrate, because that is gonna prevent us from having to roast the Galena today. So we'll try this new formula, see if it can't settle out the silver and lead better. We're gonna try it in these little cups today. As soon as that's ready, this is going in. This is what we're trying to reduce down to the actual silver, and this, Straight Galena. Then I'm gonna try to melt down and move over into this. Crucible went in, crucible came out, crucible got poured into this little form thing. All right, so you can see at the bottom of that cone, there's this little bead. See it? We're gonna melt that down to further refine away any of the lead that might be in there. It's gonna get absorbed into this bone. See that? After you get done with that, you'll go to your final step in the assaying process, which is calculating the results. Ideally, if we did this right, it would be 0.15 grams of silver. And if you look, if you're asking me, looks like it's just about Perfect, which means this is high quality Galena. So if you would've got a result like this from the assayer's office, you would've been a pretty happy miner back in the day. All right, so probably the biggest thing I learned during this is assaying is not easy. After four days of assaying, what did I get? About that much silver. A few grams or a couple of dollars worth of silver puts it all in perspective for me. And I remember just being so in awe of the process after the bead was created that I couldn't fully wrap my head around how to express it, you know? It was just like immediately this weight of how many people had to do so much stuff in pursuit of such a tiny amount of silver that it was almost overwhelming. And so after that was done, my goal after creating the silver was to create, uh, a bar like this is a special present. It's a present to you all to say thank you so much for the support and the encouragement over the past 17 months. You know, it's driven me to pursue new interests and passions and a new life that I could have never imagined before. Yep. Gonna need a lot of this. All right, it's late. amount of time to create a bar of this size from crucibles this big is intense. My goal was to fill up this old mold from Cerro Gordo, but at the rate that this is going, I don't think I'm gonna fill that all up. I'm probably just gonna fill in the nameplate there. I didn't create a full bar, but I am happy to announce I did create the face that just says Cerro Gordo on it that I am going to mount on a piece of wood from the property from the 1800s with a square nail on it. And I wrote a little note on the back, you know, something special and the date, and that's gonna be given away. So down below, there's a link, put in your email, and in the next month update video, I'm gonna choose the winner and send one of you guys this first piece of base bullion created at Cerro Gordo in 150 years. If nothing else, the process of taking 
a week of my life to make 1.5 grams of silver has left me with just a deep amount of gratitude and wonder towards all of these everyday items around us. You know, think about like the last time you went to the mall and you went to the parking lot, you turned on your car and it started right away. Did you think about the lead miner who was working in who knows what conditions that got the lead that went in the battery that made that car start? You know, probably not. Or, you know, the last time you were at a fancy dinner and you're eating, did you think about the silver miner that got the silver to make that fork? Or, you know, why even stop there? What about the prospector that found the claim that became the mine that got the silver to make the fork? Or the assayer who, you know, determined that that mine was worthwhile to mine to get the silver to make the fork? Or the truck driver who took the ore from the mine to the factory? Or the guy that created the mold for the fork? You know, you could basically go on forever like that. And I was thinking about that while I was waiting for some of the order roast and it just filled me with a lot of gratitude, you know, like it made me want to like thank all these people involved in these things that we just take for granted. You know, it's, it left me curious to know what all is lower down the totem pole in the process of creating all these items around us. And I don't think you have to melt down lead, you know, to have that sense of appreciation or wonderment, you know, even just thinking, Think about all the people that went in to making the laptop or the TV or the computer you're watching this video on. You know, it's remarkable when you think about it. It's like so many people came together in their own little roles and those little roles were their lives. And it just makes me curious about all of the other roles here at Cerro Gordo, which is something I'm gonna definitely be pursuing in future videos. But until then, <laughs> I'm gonna stop rambling. I hope you all have an amazing week. I hope you guys take a minute or two to think about all of these people that went into the items all around us. And I hope you all come back next week as there'll be a new video. And if you're interested in uh, taking home this piece of Cerro Gordo history, uh, it's free to sign up. There's an email link below. And I can't wait for one of you to have this in your home. See ya.